Rich, welcome. Great to be here, Mike. Rich, it's good to have you on the show. Uh, Rich Maltzman has been practicing project management for 32 years, and he tells me that although he is still practicing, he doesn't yet quite have it right, uh, but he keeps on trying. Rich is, uh, describes himself as a pracademic. That's to say that, firstly, he's a master lecturer at Boston University teaching project management. He's an author, he's a consultant, and he provides his students with a, a really rich learning environment. Uh, the practical part of Pracademia, I suppose, is that he comes from a 40-year career uh, in project management, uh, mainly in engineering, uh, telecoms engineering, project management. Um, but more recently, he founded EarthPM LLC, which is a company devoted to integrating the idea of sustainability into his thinking about project management and therefore into our thinking about project management. And it's quite likely that if you follow project management blogs, you will have seen Rich blogging about sustainability and project management. And uh, he's also served on the editorial board for the seventh edition of the Pimbot Guide. So this is a man who really knows and understands project management deeply. And he's, uh, he's written and co-authored a great number of books. Um, I'm not going to list them all, although you can find links down below uh, if you want to take a look at them. But the ones I, I pick out really are um, Driving Project Program and Portfolio Success, um, A Sustainability Wheel, which he wrote in 2015 with David Shirley, uh, which uh, brings that idea of sustainability to the fore, and Green Project Management, which he also wrote with Dave Shirley uh, in 2011. And if you're interested in the idea of what green project management is and what it means to us and whether you're ready to start thinking sustainably, do take a look on our website where Rich has authored a, a fantastic article for us introducing you to that whole concept of sustainability in project management. Most recently, Rich has written a book with Jim Stewart called How to Facilitate Productive Project Planning Meetings. And that's uh, what I wanted to speak with you today about, Rich. Oh, there we are. That's the book. Yep. Um, I'd like to find out your perspective on how to create those productive project meetings. So welcome to the show, Rich. Great to be here. Let's get, let's get right into the, the core of it. A lot of people take project meetings for granted, I guess. Uh, they, they turn up and then they kind of make it up as they go along. Um, they don't think of project meetings as a particularly interesting discipline to study. So what got you interested in project meetings? Why should we care about them? Well, I think you could consider project meetings to be perhaps the least interesting thing uh, to look forward to in a, a project. Uh, we are getter done type people by nature. And so sitting in a meeting, um, whether we're running it, facilitating it, uh, participating in it is, is not really our, our main focus, um, but it is the way we get things done. Um, as project managers, we don't necessarily have authority over others. Um, but we're leading them. Uh, in fact, uh, to your reference of the seventh edition Pimbach and the way I teach, I, I don't even think our title is right. I think project leader is a better title than project manager. Absolutely. Um, managers are the ones that uh, you think of as calling meetings and having meetings. But um, what got me interested in this was this is really how work gets done. Um, or you, this is how you're sending people off to do the tasks of the projects and, and make sure that that work is aligned with the uh, goals and objectives of the project. Um, we also, both of us, myself and Jim Stewart, um, the two of us who wrote this book, have 40-ish years in project management. And we've been in a whole bunch of meetings and we've seen some pretty bizarre behavior amongst people. Yeah. Um, people behave differently in groups than they do individually. Um, and meetings um, have a chance to really up the game of a project um, performance yeah. if the meetings can be productive. So what got us interested in meetings is the fact that, you know, we have to go to them. Communications is, depending on your viewpoint, somewhere between 80 and 95% of what project managers do. Yeah. Um, and what is a meeting? It's a communication. In fact, it's one of the, it can be not always is, but can be one of 
the most important communication vehicles in a project. Yeah. Um, so that's what got us interested. Yeah. Well, they, they used to be a poster in the um, health service in the UK saying, you know, are you bored? Um, go to a meeting. It's a great alternative to work. But the reality is that a good meeting can get a lot of work done. Meetings are or should or can be about making real progress on your project. But from your research, what, what are the kind of things that you found kind of get in the way of us having good, effective and productive meetings? Well, I think a lot of it is what you just said. It's, like, it's kind of summarized in that poster. It's a kind of a, a, an attitude. The presumption is that you're going to go to this meeting and pretty soon, you know, we'll have the sound of four heads on tables, yeah. boom, you know, people falling asleep. Um, so many things get in the way of, of meetings. Some of it is just the attitude going in. But there are also personality types that uh, show themselves during a meeting. And it's almost like, I never thought of it this way until just now, but it's almost like pedestrians versus drivers. Mm -hmm. When you're on the road, on the motorway, and you um, are, let's say, a little angry at a person in front of you who's weaving around on the highway or going too slow or crossing lanes, that, that driver when they get out of the car, just like you, is a pedestrian. But they seem to have totally different behaviors on the road, mm. um, unacceptable behaviors. Well, meetings are like the road. Um, there are people who um, act in meetings the, the way they never would in a one-on-one -on -one conversation or even in an email exchange or a Zoom meeting like we're doing right now, Mike. Yeah. Um, they, they, they would never just act some of the ways in which they act. In fact, in our book, we actually have a section and a theme around what we call meeting goblins. Yeah. Um, and, and these goblins take various forms, and we've actually given them personalities and names. For example, Nancy Naysayer. Yeah. So Nancy Naysayer, which can be male or female, uh, is a goblin at, at a meeting that, uh, and you know this person, and it even might be you at some time. You may want to catch yourself doing this. It, it may be a person who's, uh, no, nah, we can't do that. That's never worked. Uh, I don't like that idea. Everything is down, down, down. Yeah. Um, in the U.S., um, we have a show called Saturday Night Live, and there used to be a sketch called Debbie Downer. Yeah. And they actually would play that music. Wah, wah, wah. Yeah. So um, there's that person who's constantly just knocking ideas down when you're trying to brainstorm. And at that point, the ideas should reach the blackboard or the white whiteboard or whatever color yeah. board or whatever software you're using um, without noise. Yeah. And Nancy's producing noise. And if you know the sender receiver model, you have uh, encoding and the channel and the channel's full of noise. Well, Nancy and Charlie and all these goblins, they're forms of noise. Yeah. And actually um, and the noise they're blockers. is a nice, nice word because sometimes they, they make that noise without actually making a sound. They'll just shake their exactly. head and Shaking everyone their head. will catch that out of the corner of their eyes and it will just bring the mood down, won't it? It can be as simple as what a lot of teenagers do, right? Roll the eyes, yeah. just rolling of the eyes. Yeah. And now that idea loses all kinds of ground, especially if that's a person with gravitas. Yeah. If, that, if Nancy Naysayer is one of the VPs or key stakeholders, um, people take cues from that. Mm -hmm. And again, this is group behavior. It's different than it is uh, on an individual basis. So in, in the book, we actually take these one at a time. We have uh, six of them. We have Nancy Naysayer, yep. Charlie, the challengingly chatty, <laughs> Tina, the tangent taker, uh, Flo, the feisty flow fowler. Billy the beastly bully and Gary the gigantically garrulous. Yeah. And all of these, all of these goblins have shown up. You'll recognize them. Yeah. They won't look exactly like these crazy goblins we've drawn in the book. Yeah. Um, but they they exist in meetings. And so that's one thing that gets in the way. The other can be just the venue. Have you chosen the right venue, the right format for the meeting? All of these things can make a difference. Uh, it's many of the same things that I know, Mike, you've talked about in communications and, and trying to make things more clear in general communications. A meeting is just a special form of communications. Mm -hmm. And by the way, it crosses the all the boundaries of uh, iterative or agile and yeah. waterfall project management. Yeah, I like why you kicked off with that metaphor about being on the road, because we see some of these behaviors on the road. We see the bullies on the road. We see people who actually just want to get to the end of the journey as quickly as possible, and they will speed along without waiting for anyone else. But there are also people who actually, they're, they're there to dawdle. 
<laughs> they've got nothing better to do. The meeting is it's just a warm place to have a cup of coffee. And yeah. I, it's it's a rich metaphor. And and I do like the giving a name to a behavior helps us to recognize it and understand it. And I'm and I'm guessing it also helps us to diagnose the solutions that we can deploy. Exactly. Um, as we know from psychology, we can't, we can only look at behavior. We don't know the motivation. Yeah. And so as project managers, as facilitators, and that's really a key theme. It's even in the subtitle, it says, you know, facilitating project yeah. meetings, because that's what you are. Yeah. You're a facilitator at that point. Yeah. Um, means trying to get behind the behavior, understand the motivation, which means you might have to pull Nancy, whose name could actually be Trevor, <laughs> and pull them aside and say, Hey, um, we really want to let these ideas come through. Can you hold off? We we know you have some, we know you have some doubts about this. We're going to cover that in risk. Yeah. We're going to have a risk identification section. That's where we really need you, Nancy yeah. or Trevor. Um, speak up at that point. But while these ideas are coming up, can let's let them blossom a little bit before you pour weed pour, weed killer on them. Yeah. So what is it about project meetings that is different? Is there anything different about project meetings compared to other? organizational meetings? I would say strongly, absolutely, yes. And the reason has to do with some of the classical things that have been in, you know, PMBOK zero through seven. Yeah. Um, and that is the fact that we are managing projects that are leading projects without formal authority. Yeah. That means that this meeting, even calling this meeting and having people show up to this meeting um, for a project is different than uh, an accounting department calling a, uh, or a faculty, like I'm heading to yeah. after this, a faculty, a mandatory faculty meeting um, where, you know, it's a department and the department's having a meeting. You're some, to these folks, you're some random person without, you know, without the proper stripes perhaps on your shoulder yeah. who has called this meeting for a project which they aren't necessarily beholden to. They aren't, you know, they, it's not part of their department work. So um, both calling the meeting, setting an agenda for the meeting, and then overseeing activity at the meeting so that it's productive is different in a project case because you're not a, you're not a um, supervisory yeah. uh, figure. So I think that makes a big difference. Yeah. Okay, so I suppose the money question, what everyone's really waiting for is, you know, how can we make our meetings more, more productive? We, we haven't got the authority. We've got people whose behaviours for various different reasons and at various different times are going to challenge us. Right. What are some of the tips that you can give us? Well, one of the most simple and direct ones is don't try to do everything. And, you know, as a project manager, this is what we do. Again, it's a person, there's a personality type that is best suited for project managers. It doesn't mean that not everyone can be a project manager or project leader, because I still assert that that's possible. Absolutely. Um, but our personality type is solve problems, fix things, get blockers out of the way, get stuff done. Yeah. That's, I mean, that's what we do. It's just, I mean, I've been a supervisor of project managers. I've had groups of 15 project managers for decades. And all of them, although they have wildly different backgrounds and technical qualifications, they all took on that personality. And that's why I loved being supervisors of folks like that. That said, running a meeting may not be your strength. Mm -hmm. And running a meeting and making sure that the right focus is taking place at the meeting at the same time that you're trying to do other things, uh, not good. Yeah. So one of the things that we recommend is either develop facilitation skills or bring someone in to facilitate the meeting so that you can be, really be the note taker and the, and the kind of the observer and to make sure you're on target um, in, ter uh, in terms of what the meeting's supposed to, to cover. So it's not a bad idea to have a deputy, maybe even a hired person if the meeting's important enough um, to facilitate. Another tip, and this comes from my background in telecom. We used to have kickoff meetings with customers before we started a large deployment of uh, telecom network um, equipment and services. And often it would be um, with a customer um, like Deutsche Telekom, for example. Mm -hmm. um, that these were face the days of face to face meetings, and we'd have a meeting in Stuttgart with um, people from Deutsche Telekom. Have a meeting beforehand with the team to, to, to a pre-meeting 
I know it's another meeting, <laughs> but it's going to make the customer meeting go so much Absolutely. smoother. If, if first of all, if all the internal project team folks know each other and their drivers beforehand so that those kinds of conflicts and differences of opinion don't show themselves in, in front of the customer. So having a, a, a pre-meeting with the intent that, and the main focus of that meeting is here's what we're going to cover tomorrow. Here's why we're covering it tomorrow. And here's how we're covering it tomorrow. Yeah. And um, I think that meshes all... really nicely with your stress about don't try and do everything. Because even if you are uh, a capable facilitator, you don't want to be trying to facilitate and take notes. And, you know, as a facilitator, your, your primary interest is to make sure the meeting goes well, which means you've got to be aware of who is in the room and how they're, right. how they're contributing and who wants to contribute that you haven't heard from yet. Exactly. There's a lot to do. And if you're trying to take notes as well, if you're trying to do research as well, then you're just not going to be able to facilitate well. So I think that kind of pre-meeting, which I always recommend uh, myself, is, is so important because that also allows you to think about meeting roles. Exactly. And, and some of them, the project manager ends up doing things like the technology, mm. Getting, you know, is this, where does this cable go and the projector is not working or um, and you, you're doing that and you're trying to make sure the meeting is producing value and you're trying to let the introverted folks get their ideas come through um, and you're trying to prevent Tina from taking tangents, um, having, some, having some help there uh, or, or getting yourself upskilled in facilitation so that it's kind of second nature um, makes a big difference. Absolutely. Any other tips? Um, I would say that, and I'm going to quote the seventh edition Pimbach here. I think it's about value delivery. Yeah. As and I, here's the ironic thing: uh, as project managers, we are very outcome focused, right? Is is this going to happen? Is this going to happen? We tend to forget that in meetings. Yeah. We tend to forget that a meeting, you could almost think of it like a project. Yeah. And that it should be it should be delivering value. Yeah. Um, if you haven't got the seventh edition, you should. And if you have got the idea that one of the main themes in the seventh edition uh, Pembok guide, at least in the standard portion. Yeah. I'll, um, um, I'll put a word in here for any viewers, anyone watching this, do have a look back through uh, our playlists because uh, there's an interview with Nad Arad, one of the authors of the seventh edition, where he talks. It's about, excellent. Talks it's about an it. excellent and interview. I think that addition of value into the seventh edition, there was a lot to like about the seventh edition. Um, and, and not really much to quibble about, frankly, but that value for me is the biggest single thing because yeah. I've been banging on for years about bringing benefits management into project management. So thank you for that. And that I, to your viewers, that is, that is uh, well worth watching yeah. for a whole bunch of reasons, and accepting even getting ready for the PMP exam. It's just a great uh, video and, and not as uh, I don't want to make you blush, but a good interviewee and a good interviewer. Yeah. So that's a well, it's a good take. Yeah. Um, but it's kind of an ironic thing that as project, it's uh, it's kind of like the shoemaker's son has no shoes. Yeah. You know, the, the project manager sometimes forgets um, because of the laser focus on the project that this project meeting, especially a kickoff, and we we do focus on kickoff meetings because those are so crucial. Yeah. Um, that that kickoff meeting is a project with an outcome. Absolutely. And, and so um, thinking again about the value that that meeting is adding and is, this, is that meeting as a project going to have the outcome that you want and expect um, as opposed to, oh, I got to have the kickoff meeting. It, shouldn't be a, it should not be a rote type of thing that you do mechanically. It, you you want to make it fun. I mean, in my background, we've done activities and um, in the days of being able to go to restaurants or sports activities, um, we would always try to include something uh, as a team building exercise um, along, with the, along with the meeting or introduce some, some form of fun or playfulness in the meeting yeah. to make it memorable. So you can actually look back at it. Remember the meeting. Remember we said this in the meeting and they'll think of, you know, insert fun activity here. They'll think of that fun activity as an anchor, a kind of a mental yeah. behavioral anchor that, that refocuses them on the, the um, objectives of the project. Yeah. I think that, I mean, 
we we do put a lot of effort. I think a lot of project managers put a lot of effort into their kickoff meeting, and rightly so. Um, it is so important because that first that first impression is a la- creates a lasting impression. Um, exactly. But I think where where I have a, a little kind of gripe with the way a lot of project managers operate is they they will they will invest a lot of time in planning their kickoff meeting. They'll say, "Well, we're going to spend a whole day, and we're going to have a whole team at the kickoff meeting, so we've got to got to do it right." So they'll spend time designing it and planning it and preparing it and perhaps even rehearsing uh, key presentations as they should. But then they have a, a, a monthly or a fortnightly or a weekly team meeting, which they, they might kind of think through an agenda at the start of the project. And then they'll use the same agenda again and again and again with no thought. And yet, right. even if it's a monthly team meeting with five people attending for an hour a month, that is still 60 person hours a year. Um, yes. And, and that's a big investment. And we should be taking as much care about preparing our regular heartbeat cyclical meetings yes. putting that kind of preparation time in because you if you're not investing in that you're not getting the return and if you're not getting the return you're not getting the return on a very large amount of time commitment from people um right. so i think i think that whole thing about thinking through how your meeting is evolving what's working what's not working What's different in the environment today Mm -hmm. compared to when you last redesigned your meeting so that you can keep your meeting fresh and for purpose? I have a a phrase. I I talk about meetings being conversations and there being five types of conversation that you can have in a meeting. And the toxic version is the the meeting for ritual, the conversation for ritual. We have this meeting because we have this meeting. And it doesn't get any work done. It doesn't build relationships. It doesn't make decisions. All it does is it gets people together, leaving them resenting the time they've wasted. Because It's a morale. Yeah, exactly. And the only reason we do it is because it's a ritual and we do it. And we need to be getting rid of those meetings and and replacing them by good productive meetings. Yeah, so two other tips, not to give away the whole book, but two other tips. First of all, uh, this is almost a mantra, homework is okay. Yeah. What I mean by that is you can give people pre-meeting tasks so that they're not reading things at the meeting. So I've seen meetings where people say, well, you've seen this briefing package, you know, please read this. uh, Please take a look at it. Well, wait a minute. That's a 17 page user manual and we're reading it now, you know, ask them to, to read the executive summary of that and to flip through it please come to the meeting having looked through this document. We're going to be discussing this. Um, This works in the classroom as well, right? Uh, You know, we're going to talk about this. We're going to have a discussion about, you know, um, sprint reviews, but I want you to watch this video of a sprint review beforehand. It's five minutes. Come on, folks, just watch the five minute video. Um, So that's one is homework is okay. It's actually preferable and people will, they may have a slight resentment at first that you've given them work to do before, but now you've avoided an hour and a half of a meeting where some people have read the, the document at hand, some haven't. So the ones who are reading it at the meeting are rolling their eyes because they're reading during a meeting. And the other ones are rolling their eyes because they read it before the meeting and now they're watching other people read. So, I mean, so what's your attitude to, to real discipline around that and saying, OK, you haven't read that. Um, please step out of the meeting because we're going to carry on um, talking about that- it. I think we have to, it's kind of tough, but I think we have to be unshy about doing that. Not, please step out of the meeting for Americans anyway, and cultural aspects come into play here. I think that would be okay in the Netherlands from my two years there <laughs> <laughs> um, with, a, with a low context uh, culture. And that's actually worth studying. Is, in any case, uh, I, I agree with you. I think you could say, uh, you know, I don't know if you have to step out, but we're going to go on without, we're going to go on, you know, we, you were expected to have read this and it was, you know, we're going to take seven minutes yeah. and it's saving us an hour and a half of work. Yeah. So I, I think, I think, yeah, we, in some cases we have to, uh, I think we say in the meet in our book, we can't always be everyone's friend. Yeah. Absolutely. We want to be liked, but we can't always be everyone's friend. We have to be the project's friend, yeah. if you want to put it that yeah. way. I, I certainly um, have met people who will quite happily lock the meeting room door at the appointed hour. And mm-hmm. if other people turn up late, they're knocking on the door. Sorry, we've started. Right, <laughs> right, exactly. So uh, one other, one other t- I'm tempted to give all of them away, but one other tip is... <laughs> 
is <laughs> one other tip is uh, in terms of who should be at the meeting at different times. It's okay to have people, uh, despite your reference to a locked door, um, you can always lock it again. Yeah. Um, you can have people cycle in and out. Absolutely. So if you have a if you have an, a long meeting, ninety minutes is long, I think, um, especially for a, a, a daily scrum because that should only be ten minutes. Yeah. Um, and by the way, that's a, a really interesting idea is to have stand-ups, but um, when they're appropriate. Um, and by the way, you can have a stand-up meeting if you're a waterfall project manager. Sure, I, no I, one dies. I was having stand-up meetings back in no one in dies the, in the uh, 90s. It's it's not it's not a it's not an agile thing. The agilists didn't invent morning stand-ups. And it's and actually it doesn't matter. It's a good thing. <laughs> Period. Full stop. Yeah. Okay, so you can have people rotate in and out of the meeting um, when there are focus areas for that topic. Yeah. Um, you know, in a telecom situation, you have installation, you have testing, you have pro, you know, you have all kinds of different um, functions, and they all aren't necessary to be there all at the same time. Yes. And people appreciate the idea that I'm going to be there from ten fifteen to ten thirty for my part. And I'll be available, I'll be on call to come into the meeting if that topic comes up again. If the meeting is well facilitated, um, there may be a brainstorming session where you want them back. Okay, fine. Just keep yourself available, but you don't have to stay in this meeting to listen to the marketing people talk about their thing while, um, you know, when you really just want to talk about the steps that you need to make sure everyone's aware of for installation. Yeah. So um, that's another that's another thing. I'll give one more since you well, seem to want to. Before you do, I want to pick up on this timing thing because a big hobby horse of mine is, you know, we don't, we, yes. we too often let the, the scheduling software dictate the duration of our meetings. Yes. It, it defaults to half hour, an hour. Um, and actually, yep. you, 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 A, if you have two back to back one hour meetings, then you have no time to transition from one to the other. Yes. Physically, they may be in different rooms. You may need to make yourself comfortable. You may want a cup of coffee. You may need to read into the next meeting. You may have follow up on the first meeting. That is just absolutely, you know, a, a bit of a hobby horse of mine. We should be thinking about each meeting on its own merits. How much time do I need for this meeting? And booking that amount of time. And, and ideally, it should never be uh, the a half hour or an hour, it should always kind of shave five to 10 minutes off yes. that to give people time to transition. Yes. Well, my, my um, master's uh, degree is um, in um, human machine interaction mm -hmm. and ergonomics. So uh, the whole focus is that computers serve people, not the other way around. Yeah. I, I've often started meetings at 10.07. Yeah. I've actually gone in and interrupted um, the calendar program and said, no, not 10 o'clock, 10.07. 10.07 is more memorable. Yeah. And then people will ask crazy questions like, there's that Rich Maltzman scheduling meetings at 10.07 again. But it becomes memorable. Yeah. Well, so the other way to do tip. it is to start at 10, but to finish at, you know, 10.53. When I did sales training, I was told, if you're asking for a meeting, ask for a 17-minute meeting. Mm -hmm. And they will more, be more likely to take it, firstly, because it's not a half an hour. But secondly, yeah. because they're curious to see if you can actually stick to that 17 minutes and they will actually yes. agree to the meeting out of curiosity. And uh, yeah. of course at the start of the meeting, so we've got a 17 minute meeting. If you have any questions afterwards uh, and you want to carry on, I'll be available for as long as you need me. And they've, yeah. they've blocked out. They probably blocked out a whole hour, but they've certainly blocked out half an hour. So, um, yeah. you know, these little tips and tricks really do help us as professionals. You did say you had another tip. I have one more and I'll, I'll share this one. This is a, something I tried uh, doing, especially in a larger meeting and especially in a meeting where you know you have a lot of experienced people. Um, have, and this is, you need the time to do this. So you have to make the judgment whether you want to do it or not after you hear it. And that is you go around the room, you have people do very brief introductions, but you ask them to um, include the number of years of experience they have in this field. Mm -hmm. So uh, in the case of our kickoff meetings, we'd say, how, how many years of telecom experience do you have? We go around the room and I would be adding these up, 17, 15, 2, 0.5, 23, 40, right? And add these up. And then, um, you know, you collect that and then you, you, you introduce the meeting. Not, you don't immediately reveal this. And then you'll say at some point, I've just been taking notes here um, on our experience, and in right in this room, 
we have four and a half centuries of telecom experience. And you put it in the term of centuries. And people are like, oh, right? We're pretty, we're pretty good. <laughs> There's a lot of knowledge, a lot of, a lot of uh, knowledge and wisdom in this room. Let's take advantage of it, right? So that's actually been very um, striking uh, when people leave the meeting saying, oh, that's four and a half, 450 years of experience. Yeah just in this room. Yeah. So um, it, 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 um, it's something that we did at our kickoff meetings um, and with customers, because the, you know, at the time, a company like um, New York Telephone, which doesn't exist anymore other than as Verizon, um, would, um, would also contribute a number of years. So it's the, it's the, it's the, it's the, the vendor, we were the vendor and the customer together to have, you know, let's say approximately 500 years of experience. Yeah. But it also has that added benefit in that circumstance of creating a bond because people like people who are like themselves. And exactly. what you're doing is underlying your community of interest and, exactly. and shared, shared experience. Right. That's, we, and that's we a, good, have. a good way, you know, one, I think that's probably a, a really good way to have an early stage project meeting or a thing to include in an early stage project meeting. This is a kickoff. Yeah, we do this. It, at a, at a it establishes, you know, what we've got in the room, you know, and, and even if you don't want to, you know, make people feel bad because, they've, you know, it's my first telecoms project. You can say how many years of project management experience we got, how many years of business experience, or we could, you know, there, mm -hmm. there are lots of variants on it. And I think that's a really nice exercise. I'm not, I've not come across it before. Thank you. Yeah, we use that. So, hey. Rich, you, you've given us lots of useful uh, tips and hints. Um, we'll put a link to this book uh, yours in the uh, description so that uh, people mm -hmm. can get the whole set of tips, which you seem determined not to give away completely free. But how can people get in touch with you? Uh, because you do you do write uh, a lot online. You are you are present. Uh, so what are the best ways for people to find out about your ideas and your thinking in, in the various different fields uh, and get in touch with you if they want to? I think the best single place is to use LinkedIn. Um, and you can put the LinkedIn um, yeah, link down there. <laughs> down, down there in the Charles River, right yeah, there in the Charles River. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, yes, you can, you can do that. Um, I'm a pretty fervent, is that a word, a fervent uh, networker. Um, and I am particularly fond of networking on behalf of students. So I have a lot of graduate students. Um, who are outstanding candidates for jobs. So I've been actively uh, networking with, especially with recruiters mm. to help help out my uh, graduate students. Right. Um, so yeah, that's a good way if they connect there. I, and um, from there we can connect. The other thing, and you mentioned it already, is to, um, you can respond to posts on the projectmanagement.com site yep. where I have a, um, a blog called People, Planet, Profits and Projects, yeah. um, which is one of the official PMI um, blogs. This one happens to be about um, sustainability, but it covers it covers a lot of things. I'm currently working on, and I can't pronounce the name of the fish. Um, a a large eight, well, three meter. I'll speak to the uh, better standard three meter long fish that swims in the um, fresh waters of the uh, Amazon and uh, is impervious to piranhas. And what does this have to do with sustainability? Well, it's about biomimicry. The scales on this fish are, are once we can mimic the design of these, we'll have body armor for uh, police and, and others um, that will be much, much more effective, flexible, and so forth than uh, anything we have now. And this is just basically the fact that we can learn a lot from nature yeah. as long as we keep nature <laughs> yeah i think i think that blog is well worth reading it, it it's a very inspiring blog because you're, you're pulling ideas from all sorts of places where project managers don't normally pull ideas from or, or go for ideas and yeah one of my big things that i tell my community is that actually you know breadth is as important as depth of knowledge particularly for a project manager who wants a broad career and um, I've been working with uh, Professor Nigel Williams of um, Ports of um, Plymouth um, University in the UK, ah. um, and um, he's uh, a principal in the Responsible Project Management uh, Organization. 
of which I'm also uh, an ambassador for the U.S. in that organization. But the two of us have launched a, a video blog or a vlog, uh, video podcast called uh, PM World Savers. Okay. Uh, our first episode has dropped, um, and uh, I'll provide you with the link for that. Um, we have a series of interviews scheduled with people from all over the world who are leading um, projects that are interesting and are um, involved in some form of either social or ecological um, benefit. We'll put a link again to that channel there. or uh, that platform. Brilliant. This has been a real uh, pleasure, Rich. So thank you very much for all the time you've given us. Thank you for your fantastic tips. And um, I wish you well with your new podcast, vlog, or whatever you're calling it. Uh, thank you very much. Rich. Vlog. It's hard to say, <laughs> vlog. <laughs> Thank you, Mike. Great to be here. Enjoyed it. Bye. Please do give us a thumbs up if you like this video. I'll be creating loads more great project management content. So please subscribe to our channel and hit the notification bell so you don't miss any of it. And I'll look forward to seeing you in the next video.